Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience. I'm Tina McAndrew. Um, welcome to our Sustainable Stowe event this evening. Um, I will let Rick introduce our guest, but for now, I would like to thank the Randall Library friends. Um, I am Tina, I am the director there, and they have graciously sponsored this program tonight for us. I have muted all of you um, just to eliminate any background noise. Um, Doug will be taking questions and comments at the end. So if you think of things while he's speaking and presenting, please feel free to put them in the chat and uh, Rick will be reading them later on. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Rick. Uh, thank you, Tina. Thank you. Um, as some of you know, we've this series is now I think in its third year. And even back at the beginning, we we were trying to figure out how could we could get Doug Ptolemy here. Doug Ptolemy is a professor at the University of Delaware. Many of you, I'm sure, know of him or have heard of him. Some of you have probably seen some of his talks. We tried to pick one of his talks that is maybe less familiar to some of us than some of the others. I mean, his his talks on things like uh, Nature's Best Hope or Homegrown National Park, they, they've been terrific um, and, and very important to raising all of our consciousness regarding the choices we make in our yards. But tonight we're talking about the little things that run the world. And I know for myself, I've been stunned by some of the reports I see coming out that forecast how few uh, insects are, are going to be among us in the next few years. In fact, how few insects and others are here right now, and they are the things that we depend on. If you want your own little test of this, think back to June and how many of you were able to find fireflies in your yard. When I grew up as a child, you went out with a jar and you caught dozens of them because they were fun and they were there. I don't think my jar put an end to the fireflies and they're not gone yet, but they're certainly diminished as are many other insects and other uh, organisms that we really depend on. So I'm just very glad we get to hear from Professor Doug Ptolemy tonight. And I just want, thank you, Professor Ptolemy, and I want to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Rick. And, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how we can put the insects that run the world back in our landscapes. Fortunately, it's easier than we think. Um, so, Guide to Restoring the Little Things that Run the World, that, of course, is not my expression. That comes from uh, E.O. Wilson, a very famous professor at, at uh, Harvard. He died the day after Christmas two wow. years ago, but um, he was certainly the most famous entomologist in our country, maybe the world, I don't know. Extremely long career, 60 years. And in 1987, he wrote this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, and he had one simple message. He said, life as we know it depends on insects. And he outlined very clearly what would happen if we lost our insects. And the first thing that would happen is uh, we'd lose our flowering plants. And if that happened, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals would collapse. We would lose amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. That's, that's pretty much everything. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers. You know, all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, we humans are, are uh, included in, in those mammals that would disappear. So this is a, a drastic scenario, but it was 1987 and nobody was really worried about losing insects. Um, so uh, it was, it was uh, more or less a theoretical paper and it was ignored. And besides, if we're worried about losing our insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now, this was 1929, but our, our societal's attitude has not changed very much. This was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects. All insects, not just pests, but, you know, if it's an insect, we got to kill it. 
Uh, and even if we succeed in killing all the insects in agriculture, because that's certainly where we focus, or all the insects at home, we don't tend to worry about losing insects because we think they're still common in our natural areas. But there's two reasons that's no longer the case. And one of them is we don't have very many natural areas anymore. We've turned those natural areas into our cities, and they're certainly not designed to support insects, or in, into our suburbs, and they're not designed to support anything. Uh, or even our rural areas are not designed to support insects. Then we have agriculture. We can, let's just talk about rangeland. 770 million acres of rangeland in this country, which is designed to support cattle. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. Unfortunately, most of those, those uh, landscapes are overgrazed, which means they're very poor at supporting insects. In fact, terrestrial uh, earth, uh, is half of terrestrial earth is in some form of, of agriculture. And those areas are not designed to support insects. <clears throat> The other reason that, that our natural areas are not supporting those insects is that they are heavily invaded with plants from other continents. Um, plants mostly from Asia. This is a natural area near me, Whitley Creek State Park. And what you're looking at is, I took this picture in March. So every bit of green you see are plants from Asia that have leafed out before the plants from North America. You've got multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and autumn olive bush honeysuckle, <clears throat> calorie pear, you got it. They're all most apes from our garden. And about 30% of the vegetation in many of our natural areas are these plants from other continents, very poor at supporting insects. We'll talk about why, uh, but it's the native plants that support our insects. All right, so our natural areas have been invaded by, by hundreds of species of plants. 3,300 species of, of uh, plants from other continents are now very common in our natural areas, and they're terrible at supporting insects. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've measured uh, that a number of different times. Uh, one of the studies we're talking about was this very simple one where I simply went into hedgerows in Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, and Delaware with an undergraduate, and we measured caterpillar populations in a standardized way and hedgerows that were invaded by non-native plants. So here you've got a lot of autumn olive and multiflora rose and, and other things and compare them to caterpillar populations in hedgerows that were not invaded. So the trick was finding uninvaded hedgerows because there's not many of them left. Uh, and we found that in the invaded hedgerows, there were 68% fewer species of caterpillars. There was 91% reduction in the abundance of, of caterpillars and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the, actually, the actual amount of energy of caterpillars in those, those invaded hedgerows. Now, if we think of these caterpillars as bird food, that's a 96% reduction in the amount of bird food available. Uh, and, and the problem goes beyond that because it's not just invasive plants in our natural areas that are destroying insect food webs. Uh, the plants we typically use for landscaping at home are not designed to support insects either. 83% um, of our ornamental plants uh, in, in the areas that we've measured are non-native ornamentals that are very poor at supporting insects. Ginkgos, for example, favorite ornamental tree, supports zero caterpillars. Now, when I was young, sites like this were common. You could drive around uh, wherever you drove around. You got splattered windshields in the summertime. And if you looked up at a head, uh, a street light, that's what it looked like. Uh, and that just doesn't happen anymore. Um, I haven't seen a street light like that in a long time. So it's anecdotal, but it does suggest that we are winning the war against insects, even if it's an un undeclared war. And we are seeing headlines that reflect that now. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about a global insect decline. Uh, yeah, you know, we first recognized this with uh, declines in honeybees. Everybody's interested in honeybees because of agriculture, but that led us to be looking at what's happening to our native bees. If we just focus on bumblebees, here are some statistics. 50% of our Midwest native bees, more than bumblebees, have disappeared from their historic ranges in the last century. There are four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% in the last 20 years. So they're not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. They're no longer common enough to be forming performing their roles in their, their uh, ecosystem. There are three species of, of bumblebees that may already be extinct and 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Now they've done a better job of measuring insect declines in Europe. 30% of Europe's grasshoppers and katydids and crickets, the orthopterans uh, are facing extinction, 30%. Big study out of Germany uh, said that, that um, 
flying insects in Germany have declined 79% since 1989, with 46 species of moths and butterflies already gone from Germany. And then uh, estimates, uh, this was way back in 2014, uh, show the, the real story here. The Earth has already lost 45% of its invertebrate abundance, when most of those, of course, are, are insects. And that was, geez, that's, that's almost 10 years ago. So, boy, there we go with that noise again. Um, and of course, as you as you remove insects, you're removing the birds that, that need those insects and the other things as, as well. <clears throat> People are measuring that. The State of the Birds report in 2016 uh, said that we 432 species of North American birds are threatened with extinction. Not because there's only five left, but because of the trajectory of their population declines. They're steep enough now. We've learned that that is an impending signal of, of uh, extinction. Um, Smithsonian Group, uh, there's Rosenberg at all, said we've lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now, there's several reasons for that, but removing the food that they eat certainly has to be one of them. As a matter of fact, we went to the, the original data of Rosenberg et al., the Smithsonian group, and divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that require insects, particularly uh, when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. So things like doves and, and uh, finches and crossbills can actually make a little milk out of the seeds that they eat, and that's what they rear their young on. And look, those species did not uh, lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest that as you as you uh, take away bird food, you lose birds. Uh, even invasive species from, from England, from uh, Great Britain, the English sparrow and the uh, starling, uh, doing great around the world. But in England, they're red listed because England has sterilized its landscapes. <clears throat> so much there's simply not enough food to support these these birds and it's one of the reasons that that uh, the un predicts we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years most of them will be insects now this is a prediction it has not happened yet and we got to make darn sure that it doesn't happen because these are the species that support us on planet earth uh, and you know people wonder well what do we need insects for what do we need nature for does it matter well, yeah, it matters. The creatures that keep us alive are disappearing. What if I said to you, introduce plants are reducing your bank account by 96%. You would immediately understand that this is an issue that you have to deal with. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account, and it's our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. This is serious stuff. So I think our only viable option is to find a way to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us, to live sustainably in the natural world that sustains us. And that means we've got to include insects uh, in where we live, where we work, where we play, and where we farm. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's start with private property. Most of the land is privately owned. And if we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail, and we can't afford to fail. So east of the Mississippi, 85% 0.6% of the U.S. is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. And much of it looks like this. I took this picture from a helicopter. Here's the guy making it all nice and neat. But of course, um, this landscape is not designed to support um, anything. So how do we convert a landscape like this into a viable ecosystem? That's really what we're talking about tonight. Well, first, we have to understand the different causes of insect declines, and there are many of them. Dave Wagner at the University of, of uh, Connecticut says that insect declines, it's, it's death by a, a thousand cuts because there's so many different causes of it. Major cause would be the misuse and overuse of pesticides. Habitat loss, of course, every time we build a road or a, or a shopping center or a house, that particular area is destroyed as a habitat. Plant choice. So the plants that we, we decorate our landscapes with, um, that's the basis of the food web. And how we choose those plants is gonna determine whether that landscape can support any insects. And it's also gonna determine whether any of those plants escape our, our managed landscapes into our natural areas as invasive species. Light pollution, major causes of insect decline, and climate change is a serious issue as well. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I see this as good news because these five causes here are easily addressed by single people. Climate change, not so much. That requires policy and, and you know major governmental changes. But you, 
at home can decide whether or not you're using pesticides. You can restore habitat right in your property. You can choose the plants that support insects. You can modify your security lights at night and you can remove the invasive species that are already on your property. So let's talk about each one of those. First, we have to decide which insects we want to make. Which ones do we want to restore, bring back to our landscapes? There are a lot of insects out there. Three to four million species worldwide. It's a guess because most of them remain undescribed. We've got 164,000 described species in the U.S. Um, I can still get, I can, I can turn on a light in my yard pretty much any night and come up with undescribed species of moss. So there's a lot of, of uh, work that needs to be done by taxonomists out there. But it's a lot of species and we don't expect to have all of them in our yard. So which one should we focus on? I think there's two groups we want to focus on. First would be the insects that maintain plant diversity. Plants, of course, they are the first trophic lover. They are the ones capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into food uh, and then passing that food onto uh, food webs so that you have animals and, and functioning ecosystems. So the plant diversity is absolutely essential to everything else. Then we have the insects that actually contribute energy to food webs, which means the insects that are taking energy from those plants and passing it up the food web. I think those are the two most important groups. And we're talking about pollinators, of course. They get a lot of press and caterpillars get very little, little press. So who says these are the two most important groups? I do, and I'm given given this talk. So uh, I'm sure somebody out there will argue with me, but they are important groups. Let's first start with the pollinators. Now, again, they have gotten an awful lot of press, so we won't say as much about them. <clears throat> um, but first, let's let's talk about why we need pollinators. The media will tell you that that we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops, as if that's the only region reason. Um, that's not even accurate. Uh, they they pollinate about a twelfth of our crops. And I hear people say, "Well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators." I urge you all to forget the crop argument. It is not just about agriculture. Pollinators are pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. So if we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. We are not talking about good land stewardship. We are talking about essential land stewardship. We cannot lose our pollinators or any of the other insects. So now we need to know what a pollinator is. People see insects go to a flower and they call it a pollinator. Well, in fact, most of the insects that go to flowers are what we call flower visitors. They are there to, to use the resources of that flower, mostly nectar, sometimes pollen as well. But most of those insects are not transferring energy from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. And that's what's got, a, I don't mean energy, I mean pollen. That's uh, that's what we call uh, uh, pollination, and that is what uh, a real pollinator is. If an insect's not doing that, if they're just taking the resources without pollinating, then they're not really pollinators. So who are our major pollinators? Well, we have one species of, of honeybee, which is introduced, and it is very good in agriculture. We've got between 3,600 and 4,000 species of native bees that did most, by far, most of the pollination in North America before we brought the honeybee over. Uh, and they're perfectly capable of keeping everything pollinated. And we got about 14,000 species of moths and butterflies in North America, 2,000 of which uh, yet to be described. Um, now, these are, are, are less important, but moths in particular, butterflies are actually terrible pollinators. So let's just talk about moths. Uh, they're doing a lot of pollinating at night when we're not watching. Um, so so we have to we have to count them as well. if you if you don't believe me, next summer, go out with a flashlight and look at some of your flowering plants and look count the moths that are on those plants. Now, I urge people to um, landscape in a way that in, in allows pollinators to make a living uh, where they where they live on your in your property. And they say, well, and I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get stung. And I say, no, no, you're not going to get stung. Uh, most of our native bees are, are not uh, um, social. They're solitary bees. They're not protecting a hive uh, and they're not aggressive at all. You can pet them when they're pollinating. You will not get stung. And they say, well, I got stung last week. And what they really got stung by was a yellow jacket or a, a hornet, bald-faced hornet or a polistes wasp. These guys are all wasps. They're not bees at all. Uh, and they are aggressive and they are stinging. And I'm not talking about putting their, their nests in your yard. I'm talking about native bees, which are herbivores. They're not predators uh, and they are uh, quite docile. So how do we focus on making native bees in our yard? 
we need to give them uh, something to, to eat and a place to live. That seems pretty obvious. So first, where do native bees live? Three major places. Um, they're ground nesters, they're woody stem nesters, and pithy stem nesters. Now, most of our native bees are ground nesters. 70% of the native bee species nest in the ground. And they're pretty easy to see in the springtime before you've got a lot of vegetation growing up. This is a Kalides uh, bee. These, of course, are, are all females. And they sink a, a, a single shaft down into the ground. Uh, you can see the disturbed soil where they pulled it up. And then they have these little side shafts. They pack them full of pollen and um, then lay an egg on it. And that is, is how they reproduce. Uh, but again, it's, it's single females, um, just just creating a, a, a family unit and they're not aggressive. They're not going to protect it. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're very shy. If a shadow hits these guys, they dive back in into their uh, into their hole. So, you know, they're ground nesters. If you own ground, uh, you can help native bees. And most of us with houses do own, own ground. They prefer a slight uh, south facing slope. Um, you know, soil that's easy to dig in is, is favored, but there are species of native bees that can dig in the toughest clay. So it's not absolutely necessary. A little bare spot, they, they don't like to compete with vegetation very much. Uh, that's not gonna get sprayed and it's not gonna get a lot of foot traffic. You put a little side a spot like that aside and you can support native bees. Woody stem and pithy stem nesters make a series of cells inside of, of sticks or logs uh, or the stems of many of our, our meadow plants. So this picture is from Heather Home, uh, showing you three cells. Uh, and of course they're sequentially made. So this is the oldest one. The uh, female bee packs it full of pollen, then she lays an egg. And this is what a bee larva looks like, not much. You can't even tell what the head is. Um, but here it is, it's eating the pollen. This guy's the oldest one, so it's biggest. This one's uh, next in line, a little bit smaller. This one's smaller yet. And it just makes a series of these cells uh, right down the stem. And when they mature, they pupate in these cells and then they tunnel out laterally right through the edge, uh, leaving a, a hole. So these are the kinds of stems we're talking about. And this creates a, a management problem because if you have a, a meadow, let's say you've got goldenrod or, or uh, uh, Joe Pye weed or New York ironweed, uh, those are great stems for these pithy stem nesters to nest in, but we tend to cut them off at the base in the fall because they look messy. Of course, when you do that, you're losing the seeds that the birds will use all winter long. So I urge you, if you're going to do fall cleanup, to leave these stems uh, until the birds have eaten the seeds. And maybe in March, you want to cut them back, but only cut them back, cut them back so you're leaving about 15 inches from the ground because the, those stems, after you cut them back, is where the bees that following summer are going to nest. The new plants will grow up past them. You won't even see those, those dead stems, but those are the valuable nesting sites uh, that, that summer, and that is where the bees will overwinter the following winter. Um, so keeping these pithy stems around is, is essential for our native bees. Woody stems, they're going to nest in, in plants that are easily excavated, plants like elderberry where the wood is very soft, sometimes willow, um, or, or uh, downed branches that are starting to rot. So here the bees, the cells have, have already produced their, their bees and they've emerged and it, it tells you that was a successful breeding site. But you know, what do we do? We get a dead branch in an elderberry. Well, as good gardeners, we prune it out. Try to leave some of those things because that's what the bees depend on. That's hard to do in suburbia. You know, we've got this neatness thing and, and uh, you don't want your neighbors to get mad at you. So we do clean up all the, the we call it coarse woody debris, leaving no sites for the bees to nest in. But we've invented these bee hotels and people love bee hotels. Some people really love bee hotels and they make a lot of, a lot of options here. Um, so it's fun and the bees do use it. The problem is when you concentrate a whole bunch of nesting sites in one area, if a predator or a disease finds that site, it can be devastating. So it is much better to make tiny little, little bee hotels, several of them, and scatter them around your property uh, the way woody debris would be. You want to protect them from the uh, rain. So little shelters be important. So in other words, you're not putting all your bees in, in one basket. Uh, you know, natural beetle holes are really the best people are finding. The trouble with the bee hotels is you've got to clean them out. It's hard to clean them out without destroying the bees that are that are in those holes. 
if you find a, a, a dead log, and anybody who's who's been through an emerald ash borer uh, invasion knows there's a lot of dead ash logs out there. Well, beetles have emerged from those those logs, and those are perfect holes for a number of different types of, of uh, bees. So you put the log up there, you use it for a couple of years, then replace it with another one, and you never have to worry about cleaning anything out. Everything will be will be natural. Okay, what do bees need to reproduce? They need pollen and they need nectar and they need it all the time. Uh, Jared Fowler did a study in New England showing that uh, there are native bees active from March all the way to November, uh, which means they need blooming plants from March to November. And this is the hardest thing to do when you're trying to support pollinators is to have a continuous uh, bloom. Um, this is why no mow May doesn't make any sense. You can't just provide forage during May uh, and remove it the rest of the year because uh, that's that pulls the rug out of anything that started to uh, to breed. Um, and that brings us to the question of which plants should we plant for for native plants? Well, this is the next challenge. Uh, it turns out that about a third of our native bees, so if we've got four thousand species, that's what thirteen, fourteen hundred species of bees are. Uh, pollen specialists. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular species of plants. And those are the ones we should, we should focus on. We should plant the plants that support the most specialist bees because the generalist bees like bumblebees can use those, those plants as well. If you only plant for generalist bees, and that's where a lot of our non-native flowering plants come in, things like zinnias and, and uh, butterfly bush, uh, you know, they produce a lot of nectar and a lot of bees do go there, but not the specialists. They're not going to get the pollen that they need and you lose a lot of species of bees. Um, bees specialize because um, the plants want them to. The plants want to move their pollen efficiently. They don't want generalists to take it to the wrong plant. So they evolve pollen grains with very, very specific uh, little nungies on there that grab onto the hairs of particular species of bees so that it clings very well. They flower at particular times. They smell and look different from other flowers. Um, they, their nutritional value uh, varies. So these are all features that bees can specialize on so that you get this very tight relationship between the, the particular species of plant and uh, a particular species of pollinator. Everybody else who comes to that flower is an unwanted um, you know, pollen robber or nectar, nectar robber. Those are why bees specialize. So for example, you won't have Andrena faciliae unless you have facilia. You've got to have the plant they've, they've uh, specialized on over evolutionary time, or you won't have that particular bee. You've got, if you want Andrena asteroides, you need native asters. If you want Andrena erigine, you need spring beauties. Um, just about every plant that's out there has specialists associated with it, Calides albescens on, on false indigo. But some species support a lot of specialists, like perennial uh, sunflowers, um, asters, native asters, goldenrods. Those three alone uh, are very good. If you have those three in, in New England, you're going to support about 40 species of, of native bees that won't be in your yard if you don't have these three plant genera. Uh, but you can go right down the list. Uh, and <clears throat> so this is a great, great plan. You've got your asters, you've got your goldenrod. Not only is it good for specialist bees, it's great for migrating monarchs uh, because this is this supplies the the fall um, nectar that allows those monarchs to get to to Mexico in good shape, and it's pretty. So if you want to know what the best plants are for uh, pollinators, for specialist pollinators, go to National Wildlife Federation's Keystone Plants by Eco Region. Uh, and it will give you a list of the best plants uh, for your ecoregion. Now it's developed at ecoregion level one, which is pretty generalized. Um, we're trying to move that to ecoregion level two so you can get a little bit more specific where you where you live. But still, it's a very good, good uh, resource. All right, that's all we're going to say about pollinators. Let's talk about those caterpillars that everybody else ignores. They are the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Not just any other type of insect, but any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes without a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs or eventually failed ecosystems, which is exactly the opposite of what gardeners have been doing forever. If you see a caterpillar, you got to kill it. No more of that. They're essential. So how do we increase the number of caterpillars in our, our yards? Uh, well, theoretically, it's easy. You just put the plants in your yard that support a lot of caterpillars. 
Um, there is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars, so we have to be fussy about it. And this is a good example. This is elderberry, you know, nice flowering plants, makes wonderful uh, sweet berries for the birds during the summertime, but very few things eat the leaves of, of elderberry. If you really want to support breeding birds with caterpillars, you don't you don't depend on elderberries. I mean, they're part of your landscape, but they're not going to be the ones that are supporting your caterpillars. So why do we have so many specialist caterpillars out there? Well, plants have, have made them specialize. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun. So they've, they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? This is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects, particularly those caterpillars that are the bread and butter of our, our food webs, are host plant specialists. They can only eat the plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to develop and reproduce on plants that are defending themselves with, with nasty things. So they've got specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionarily interacting with plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant, which is why our, our native insects are very poor at eating plants from Asia or South America or some other place. They've never interacted with them before. So it turns out there's three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute a lot of energy to local food webs. Remember, plants are... are, are Capturing energy from the sun, it all starts with the sun. And they're taking that energy and, and creating food. Uh, the simple sugars and carbohydrates through, through photosynthesis, storing that food in their, in their leaves. Contributors donate a lot of that food up the food web so that you have the animals that, that run our, our uh, ecosystems. Plants that don't do that, are, we call them non-contributors. They're making uh, food from the sun, but they don't pass it on. And then they're plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. So the best example of a contributor around the country and 84% of the counties in which it occurs is one of the oaks. Uh, we got 91 species of, of North American oaks and they're contributing more energy to local food webs than any other type of plant genus by far. Good example of a non-contributor would be a, a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. Nice ornamental plant, good fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to the local food web. And a good example of a detractor would be calorie pear, Bradford pear, or any of the invasive ornamentals that we've brought in. Privet and barberry and burning bush and, and porcelain berry and on and on and on. Um, not only are they not contributing energy, but they escape our plantings and push out the native plants, the native contributors that are running the food webs. Um, so what I'm truly trying to say here is that plant choice matters. We're not going to be able to rebuild uh, insect populations anywhere if we don't choose the right plants that support those insect populations. So if we want the Pandora Sphinx, for example, you gotta have Virginia creeper. That is what they have specialized on. Uh, if you want the tulip tree silk moth, you got gotta have tulip tree. If you want Luna moth, you know, it depends on where you are in the country, but where I live, Luna moths have specialized on, on sweet gum. Um, and, and maybe in the Ozarks, they specialize on oaks. So they specialize in different plants as you move around the country because you got to have those plants or you don't have any Luna moths. Uh, zebra swallowtail, wherever you are, has specialized on, on pawpaws. Um, grapes support a lot of, of uh, caterpillars, a lot of moths, uh, like the spotted uh, eight-spotted forester moth. Green marvel is on viburnum, brown hooded owlet on, on goldenrod, along with 110 other species on goldenrod, very powerful plant. Even poison ivy supports uh, host plant specialists like the beautiful utilia. By the way, you know, people don't like poison ivy. You know, when you get poison ivy is when you try to get rid of it. Just leave it alone, learn what it looks like, and you can live with it. It's, it's actually a very powerful native plant. Sculptured moth on persimmon, the Hebrew on black gum, our poor ashes support a lot of sphinx moths, particularly the beautiful sphinx moth or the beautiful fawn sphinx. I think that's art in the garden, by the way. 
um, maples, powerful plants. Rosy maple moth on, on maples. The royal walnut moth is on walnut and hickory and already extirpated from most of, of New England. Uh, so we are losing moths and this is one of the most special ones that we have uh, or don't have. Double tooth prominent on, on elm. Elm's a great plant. Witch hazel dagger moth on witch hazel, believe it or not. Imperial moth on pines. On native clematis uh, have the spotted th thyrus. Two-toned two ancillus on ironwood, the lost owlet on buttonbush. I mean, we can go on and on and on and on. The herald on native willows. This is the snowberry clearwing. It's a specialist on coral honeysuckle, the native honeysuckle. Um, if you want the evening primrose moth, you got to have evening primrose. And they come, they spend the day with, the, with their head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but uh, it's always very cute. Showy emerald on sumac. And I'm not talking about about uh, poison sumac. I'm talking about uh, smooth sumac or staghorn sumac, great soil stabilizers. You never have to go to an Asian plant to stabilize your soil and you get this beautiful moth. Then there's some real powerhouses, things like our native uh, prunus, black cherry, great one. will support the white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the cecropia moth, the colorful zale, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth? The paddle caterpillar, send your kids outside, tell them to find a paddle caterpillar and figure out what these paddles are for. Don't tell them, don't tell them. They're not decorations, they're there for a reason. And I'm not gonna tell you what they're there for. You've got to figure it out yourself. Uh, it's the same reason that the filament geometer has these expandable filaments. It's kind of like the Hydra. Um, and they're all on black cherry. Small eyed Sphinx, Harris is three spots, uh, this is this is a, a great caterpillar that holds, looks like an umbrella of its shed head capsules over its head. And if you get near it, it'll whack you with them. Um, some beautiful moses, snowy shouldered eclaris. Uh, then oak, the most powerful plant of, of all, uh, supports all kinds of caterpillars. Things like the hag moth, the red wash caterpillar, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak. Uh, they call them slug, slug caterpillars because the head is tucked up underneath. They're not really slugs. The skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, orange patch smoky wing, the half oval ancillus, the crown slug. Pink striped oak worm. This is my favorite, the spun glass slug caterpillar. Um, imagine the amount of adaptation that went into creating a, a work of art like that, plus hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other species use oaks, which is why I call oaks keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch, and if you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building outside as the two by fours that hold that house up. They are essential. They are the support system. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for, for the last century. So what is the best keystone plant? Again, uh, it, it depends on where you live, but in most of the country, it's one of the oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars. Compared to tulip trees, you know, good native plants, but they only support 21. So there's huge differences among our native plants. Over 950 species supported nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. So how do you find out what the best uh, plants are where you live, what the keystone species are? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website uh, and uh, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. These are abbreviated lists I just ran out of out of room. So the old excuse of we don't know what to plant to support the, the local insects, that's that's gone. You do know to, what to plant now. Just go to Native Plant Finder. So people say, well, where'd you take all those pictures of those, all those, those insects? I took them right here. This is this is where I live. This is where my wife and I uh, bought a, a piece of property, a farm that was was broken up into 10 acre lots in back in 2000. And we built a house. Um, the last thing they did in this farm, it was very old. It had been farmed almost 300 years. So um, not much left there. And the last thing it did was mow it for hay. So there were very, very few plants there. Uh, and and this is what it looks like today. We, we got rid of the invasive species. We, we planted uh, native plants. I'm still adding uh, native plants. 
Uh, the diversity is not nearly what it was, I'm sure, before it was farmed. But my research has shown over the years that if you know the number of species of moths, the number of species of those caterpillars in your food web, you have a very good index of how, uh, how, how stable that food web is and how productive it is. In other words, how many other species it's supporting. So for the last six years, I've been taking pictures of every species of moth that occurs on, on our property. And I'm still at it and I'm up to 1,256 species of moths. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet that are occurring on, on our property because we put the plants back. Uh, these are the plants we put back. Just some of them. We've added witch hazel and oaks and persimmons and American elm and red maple. None of these things were here. Viburnums, black gum, buttonbush, evening primrose. And we tolerated an awful lot of plants that were here, but people typically consider weeds. Black cherry, the number two plant on our, on our list. Black willow, tied with black cherry in terms of productivity. We tolerate poison ivy. We tolerate green briar, dotter. Virginia creeper. These are all things that have bad reputations, but they're very powerful in terms of, of supporting food webs. And because we have so many species of moths on our property, we have a lot of species of birds that are able to reproduce on our property because the, that's the moth caterpillars that those birds are feeding their young. We've got wood thrush, believe it or not. That bare, bare land is now supporting wood thrush because of the trees that we have added to our property. Planted from seed, by the way. You don't have to buy 15 foot uh, oak trees. Uh, we've allowed the Virginia creeper in. They produce the lettered sphinx, sphinx and that is what this, this uh, uh, bird is feeding its, its young. We've got indigo bunnings because we've got alders that, that uh, make ruby quakers. We've got chipping sparrows because we've got black walnuts that make gray edge boma locus. Oaks because we've got, uh, or we've got field sparrows because we've got oaks making red line panopotus, tufted tip mice because we've got black cherries making dowdy pinions. Phoebes because we've got native grasses uh, that, that uh, are making lots of, of skippers. This guy actually was breeding on our, our light over our front porch. And the robins, everybody says, well, they feed their young worms. They feed their young, young worms when that's all you have is big lawn and, and worms, but they, they love the, the insects. Worms are extremely low in nutrition, by the way. Carolina chickies, because we've got tulip trees making tulip tree beauties. White-eyed vireos, because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtail. And sassafras, they both make, both make their close relatives. They make the spice bush swallowtail. House wrens, because we've got hickories making copper underwings. Bluebirds, because we've got sycamores drinking, making drab prominence. You get the picture. We have recorded 62 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres because we put the plants back. And there's a lot of caterpillars on those plants. I'm telling you this because the World Wildlife Fund says that we have lost two thirds of our wildlife since, since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could restore biodiversity in an awful lot of places. So picture your, your future yard is looking like that. You can still have your lawn, but it's really just the place where you're going to walk. If you choose the right plants and if you use more of them, we could restore insect populations pretty much everywhere. So I'm going to leave you with nine things. 10 things, huh, nine, 10, uh, a lot of things that uh, you can do to restore uh, ecosystem function by returning insects to your, your yard. And I'm going to start with reducing the area that's, that's in lawn. Uh, latest figure I've seen, of course, is 44 million acres of lawn dedicated to an ecological deadscape. And we do that because uh, it is a status symbol. Um, and we need to display our Halloween decorations. You know, I drive by this church in, in, in Mississippi and I'm thinking, boy, everybody's inside studying God's creations and on the outside, they're killing them all. We're not thinking, we're not thinking. So uh, that's it. I talk a lot about that in, in other talks. We've got to reduce the area, just cut the area of lawn in half and we'll be in good shape. Plant for specialist bees. We talked about that. Uh, remove invasive species from your property. You know, if you don't know what an invasive species is, it's a it's a non-native plant that is aggressively displacing native plants, and we've got a bunch of them. English ivy, major major problem. Calorie pear, <laughs> major major problem. Porcelain berry, the the kudzu of the north, grows over everything. Burning bush, privet, Chinese elm, glossy buckthorn, um, armor honeysuckle. Uh, there are, there are many. 
uh, but um, not so many that we can't learn what they look like, recognize them on our property and get rid of them. Remember, if everybody got rid of the invasives on the, their own property, that's all you have to worry about. We'd be 78% done in the entire country and 85% done east of the Mississippi. Use keystone plants. We talked about that. You know where to find them, native plant finder. Landscape for caterpillars. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, particularly underneath the trees that these caterpillars are using. So I'm going to use oaks as an example. Um, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. Got to keep those numbers updated. A few of them, like the, the polyphemus moth, um, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and sing, uh, you know, hangs from one of the branches. Then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of the species develop on the tree, they finish growing as caterpillars, then they drop from the tree, wiggle their way beneath the soil and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the ground. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter on the ground. Uh, we don't tolerate it, it's messy. And we mow and compact the soil under our tree so that it's rock hard, particularly in the summertime. And when those caterpillars drop down, they can't get underground. And this becomes an ecological trap. You're calling in the moths to lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop and they drop down and many, most or all of them die. I am convinced that this is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course the cement landscape is not the answer either. Now this is what most people do. You've got a tree in a yard, um, I've got a new grad student, Emma Jonas, this, this year, who is looking at how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you have a layered landscape. You got a tree, maybe a, a, a Florida dogwood here, then a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. This is soft landing. The caterpillars fall down. Um, the ground is not compacted. Compaction is probably the major uh, feature here that allows success. The caterpillars can get underground and pupate, or they'll spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's captured by this, this ground cover. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your, your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, folks. Put a big bed around every tree that you have, and all of a sudden you've got less lawn out there. The bigger, the better. The tree will love it, and so will those caterpillars. Use the native ground covers we have available to us liberally. Things like wild ginger, mayapple, foam flower, ferns. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants there. Again, caterpillars will love it and so will those trees. Reduce your light pollution. It turns out that lights are one of the major causes of insect decline around the world. Uh, but this actually is, is uh, an easy one. It's a very easy one. All you have to do is turn your lights out. Uh, here are all the, ways, the ways that lights are killing insects, um, particularly the moths that make those caterpillars that run our, our food web. Uh, but because it's so easy to, to fix, um, I see this as good news. If light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines and it's the easiest thing to fix, that's a good, good start. Um, but I know what a lot of people say, well, well, I, I can't turn the light out over my, my barn or over my, my garage or my front porch because the bad man will come. Well, okay, put a, put a motion sensor on, on that light so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. Uh, and the first thing you realize is the bad man does not come very often. And if you, even easier than that is to take the white bulb out of that security light and put in a yellow bulb, yellow incandescent or yellow LED. Um, nocturnal insects do not come to yellow lights. I mean, they're far less attracted to yellow lights. So if we were to switch out our white bulbs for yellow lights overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we used LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. Opposed mosquito spraying. Mosquito spraying. It's a booming business around the country. And they say, you know, it's okay because what we're spraying is, what we're fogging with is pyrethroids. It's a natural product. And because it's natural, it's okay. It is a natural product. It's, it's pyrethroids from, made by uh, chrysanthemums as an insecticide. But cyanide is a natural product. Ricin is a natural product. Nature makes a lot of nasty natural products. So being natural, that, that doesn't make any sense. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. Uh, and that's not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with. Look, all the insects. It comes in contact with everything. 
including our beloved monarch. You know, monarchs are red listed now. We've lost about 96% of them. Uh, this is the result of a mosquito fogging event in uh, the eastern shore of, of Maryland, but it's happening all over the country. So we're hammering the, the monarch from all sides. We take away the milkweed. We, we hit, hit them with our cars and we spray them with our mosquito sprays. What's interesting is this does not control mosquitoes. So we're doing all these things for nothing. It's very hard to control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You have to kill 90% of them to get good control. These guys kill between 10 and 50% of the mosquitoes, which is why they have to keep coming back and back and back and fogging all over again. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Uh, and mosquito dunks, biological control using mosquito dunks is a best the best way to go. Get a bucket and fill it full of water. Put in a handful of straw or hay uh, or maybe some dead leaves and put it out in the sun for, for a few days. What you're doing is building out, building up the populations of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to the, the female mosquitoes in your yard that want to lay their eggs. They will preferentially lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store, you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12, uh, put in a mosquito dunk. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So if a dragonfly gets in here, won't hurt it a bit. If your dog drinks it, no problem. You might put a coarse screen over it so the local chipmunk doesn't commit suicide. But it's targeted, it's cheap, it works, particularly if everybody did it. But you know what? This works too. If you just want to use your yard without bothering to kill anything, get a fan, plug it in, uh, and sit in the breeze. The mosquitoes do not fly into the breeze, and you can enjoy, have a nice picnic uh, with no problems at all. Minimize insecticide use overall. If you go to the hardware store and you look at the rows and rows and rows of insecticides up on the shelves that homeowners are using... Um, and they're using it for no reason. The only the only justified use of insecticides at home uh, is termites, and that should be done by a professional using bait systems. So um, you know we're killing uh, insects because of entomophobia. We don't we just don't like them. That's not a good reason. And plus, you're living in an envelope of poison uh, when you you're spraying this stuff all over your your house. So try to minimize that. And no bug zappers. We did a study way back in 1996 where we looked at the catch underneath bug zappers and it turned out that almost none of the insects that are killed are mosquitoes or biting flies. So 99.98% of the insects killed are non-targets. Uh, so again, it's just entertaining. You hear that zap when you've killed an insect, but it's not a mosquito. Um, they ought to be banned. They really ought to be banned because, um, because they're killing everything and, and they're not helping the situation. One of the reasons people think they've killed a lot of mosquitoes is because they're killing a lot of, of midges, a lot of chironomid midges that don't even have mouth parts. They look like mosquitoes, but they are not. Then finally, uh, join your, your homeowners association and change from within. Uh, I hear all the time that uh, the people can't do what I'm suggesting because of the rules where they live. The homeowners association says you've got to use these plants. You've got to mow your, your lawn to death. You've got to spray everything. Um, well, these are rules made by by people who usually back in the 70s, they they didn't know anything about uh, sharing the landscape with with nature. They didn't think they needed to. They thought humans were here and nature was someplace else. Uh, and it was about status. We want to have a high status neighborhood. No more junky cars in the front yard. So we're going to make all these rules and everybody has to toe the line or or move. Well, you know, they're learning that uh, in, in terms of ecological integrity, these rules are a disaster. And I'm getting emails from people who have actually joined the Homeown Association and, and uh, you know, discussed these issues and said, look, this is, this is not the future. Uh, and it's working. You know, these are reasonable peop people. They, the, it was people that made those rules. It's people that can change those rules. And we have to do it. It's much better to change from within than to be aggressive and change from, from outside. Although a, a, a couple in Maryland um, recently sued their HOA, who said they had to get rid of their native plants, and they won. So that's a, it's now a legal precedent um, warning HOAs that they're losing their clout. Um, but we can landscape in a tasteful way that will not reduce property values uh, using lawn as a cue for care. 
Uh, that's another whole talk, but but um, it's easier if we do it that way. Okay, um, I'm going to end the way I started with with uh, E.O. Wilson. In 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. If we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet or it's going to disappear everywhere. That's a very bold statement. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He did not spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that's that's great news. We'll just put half the Earth aside. Uh, and and uh, other than everything that's in trouble will be in that half, and then we humans will be in the other half. But of course, um, half of terrestrial Earth, as we said, is already in some form of agriculture. We got 8 billion people in the other half, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. Um, so the only way to realize EO's dream, uh, in, in my view, is to get a new approach to conservation. And that is, we've got to give up the notion that humans and nature cannot be in the same place at the same time. We're going to have to share our landscapes. And when we do, it's extraordinarily rewarding. I mean, that's what Cindy and I are doing at home. A lot of people are doing it. It's, it is wonderful. We can coexist. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to save insects for, for a living, but you can save them where you live. If you do, it empowers you. You know, more and more people are worried about the state of the planet, but they feel they feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can get, get rid of their invasive plants, one person can use keystone plants, one person can can uh, modify their light system, one person can fire Mosquito Joe, um, one person can can uh, uh, get rid of that bug zapper. They can do a lot of things and and totally revitalize the little ecosystem where they live and and then enhance their local ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. It can also be a model for the people around them. Uh, who who actually will say, well, geez, this is this is a good thing. I'll do that as well. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So insect decline is real. It is a global problem, but it does have a grassroots solution. And if each one of us do our part, uh, we can we can beat it. We really can. We created this problem. We can solve it. Well, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Doug. This has been a great talk. We're beginning to get questions, as you might expect. Um, I'm going to take the first uh, comment that came in and break it into two questions. Um, one question was, Henry Zelfin has switched to using buckthorn here as a host plant. How do we approach reducing the buckthorn without harming the butterfly? Well, that is a new one on me. I had not heard that. <laughs> Henry Zelfin is using buckthorn. Okay. All right. Let's assume that's true. Jeez. Um, You know, you got to, uh, we'll just talk generally here. You've got to look at the net costs and the net net benefits of, of a plant. So for example, um, the silver spotted skipper has started to use kudzu. So people say, okay, it's supporting kudzu. We can leave it alone. But what is lost by by leaving kudzu there? Well, you lose just about all the other plants and all the things that 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 use those plants. So you're trading thousands of species for the addition of one. So the net cost of of uh having kudzu around uh, far exceeds the benefits uh and and there the decision is easy um i'll have to look into this this uh elfin using using buckthorn but um it's probably only local find out where it is uh, you know if it's on your property i guess you want to keep it around but but what's it isn't isn't it's what's its native plant get that back in the landscape and in, in abundance um Life's full of trade-offs, and you know that's a bad question to start off with. Give me one I can answer. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, the, the next one may or may not be that good. Good. How worried should we be about the impact of Asian jumping worms that have increased exponentially, especially this past year? They're terrible. They're terrible, and we don't have a great great solution to them. The only the only 
positive thing I've heard about jumping worms is that um, they do poorly on oak leaf litter. So increase the percentage of oaks in your landscape. There's a lot of good reasons to do that. Um, and um, the, the worst populations seem to be correlated with over overabundance of deer. And nobody knows why. Uh, Bern Blasi at Cornell studying this, but uh, the correlation seems to be real. And if that's true, that's just one more reason to reduce the the abundance of deer in our property, which are, you know, there are lots of reasons to do that. But the jumping worms are uh, uh, just a serious, serious problem. Uh, and nobody has a silver bullet for it. Be careful when you're moving soil or, around. You know, they're, they're annuals. In other words, they don't overwinter as adults. They overwinter as tiny little egg cases. Um, so it's very difficult to to see that they're there, um, but it gives you a a uh, and it reduces the population of active worms down to nothing each year, and then they start again in the spring when they hatch out. So if you have a lot of oak leaf litter, that's the time to spread it out. Um, uh, that's another terrible question. Give me one I can answer. <laughs> uh, okay. Um... What are your recommendations for invasive insects such as spot, spotted lanternfly or bagworm? Well, bagworm's not invasive. That's a native. Remember, an invasive has to be a non-native displacing native native plant. So bagworm is a native. It, 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 it's one of the eruptive species, and it's typically only eruptive when we're spraying, which kills all of its parasitoids, because it's got a lot of parasitoids, and when we give it a monoculture of what it likes, things like arbovitae or, or uh, uh, eastern red cedar. So if you're making hedges, uh, don't make it a monoculture. Make it a very uh, group of, of species. I've got bagworm at, at my house, but I have to look to find it. Uh, because we don't spray anything. We've got the big ichneumonid parasitoids uh, and and it's easily controlled by its natural enemies. Um, spotted lanternfly, there's actually good news there. Of course, it's another invasive we, we brought in uh, that uh, really likes Alanthus, develops very well on Alanthus. So that's a good reason to get rid of your, your tree of heaven uh, because it does support the spotted lanternfly. Uh, it's you know it's a sucking insect, which means it can it can get right into the uh, phloem of uh, a lot of plants, particularly vines, particularly grapes, um, loves fruit trees, uh, and it dodges the the insect defenses. So it can or the plant defenses. So it can eat a lot of things. But mysteriously, this year, right around here, which is kind of the origin of their their uh, where they came in, their populations are crashing like crazy. So last year they turned my my uh, butternut tree trunks black with their their sooty mold. This year I found two total population crash, and it's happening all around us. Again, nobody knows why, but uh, they seem to be controlling themselves, much like the the um, brown marmorated stink bug did. It was terrible for several years, but then it just started to decline, and they're they're still here, but not in the numbers they used to be. So I'm I'm hoping that that happens with the spotted lantern fly, and we don't have to go crazy doing doing things. Um, this is another Asian jumping worm uh, question. I think you've sort of answered this, but do you have any advice for those of us who already have Asian jumping worms on our properties? And I'd have to say, who doesn't? But actually, I don't. I don't. You know. Oh, good for you. Um. No, I don't have any, any advice. I really don't. Don't don't uh, don't move your soil around. To give it to somebody else. They don't move very fast. We're the ones that move them. Um, so hope that you know. I don't know. Ask universities to fund research better. There are very few people working on this because they're so hard to work with. Uh, so yeah, just no good news there. I'm sorry. Well, I know that many people feel that they come onto their property when they buy bagged mulch or something similar, and that's when they they could they could if they're if they're yeah because those egg sacs are very tough to see. Yeah, use the leaves of the trees on your property as mulch. That is the best mulch that's out there. Which brings up another question: um, In our property, we typically you know collect the leaves, but we might chip them so that they'd break down faster. You know, we have a, a special thing that, you know, you, you throw the leaves in and spits them back out in smaller pieces. Do you recommend that or is that a bad idea? 
I don't recommend it for two reasons. One of the major things that your leaves are doing is is creating a blanket on the soil community that maintains the, the, the soil moisture levels, the humidity right through the summer. If your leaf litter doesn't make it through the summer, you, you don't have enough leaf litter. And if you chip it up, it doesn't last nearly as long. Again, this is where oak leaves are so great because a single oak leaf can take up to three years to break down. Um, now, the other important thing that leaf litter is doing is returning the nutrients your tree used that year to the soil. So you had this closed nutrient system. If you rake it away and give it away, you're, you're starving your trees over, over time. So chipping it won't, won't remove the nutrients. That's, that's fine. But if you've got a, a luna moth cocoon in there or anything else, and there's a lot of things living in that leaf litter and you chip it up, you've killed all that stuff. So, um, Chipping it to make it break down, it, it's like it's like saying, uh, you know, I've got this bank account and I want to I'm going to spend it as fast as possible because <laughs> I don't want it to be there. <laughs> Keep it around. You want those leaves are good. OK, uh, different question. Do you have uh, uh, on our property? Did you do anything on your property? Did you do anything to change the soil on your farm as you well, use native plants or did you just start planting seeds? Um, I, one thing I did do, and we had subsoil in a lot of places. I mean, it was pretty bad. Not only that, but the, uh, the one end of the property, the soil is very close to serpentine soil, which is pretty toxic stuff. I brought in leaf litter from the township that collects it off the street and then, uh, composts it for a year and puts it out for free. And I brought in truckloads of that stuff when I planted things in the beginning, um, now, this was before, this was 20 years ago, and there wasn't any any uh, Asian jumping worm issue back then. I wasn't even thinking about it, and I got away with it. But uh, our soil is pretty good now. I mean, you hear how it takes a, a thousand years to build a, an inch of topsoil. Um, it doesn't take a thousand years to put organic material back into your your soil, and that's what what we did. Uh, so even that that serpentine soil is, is is producing a lot of plants now. So that's another valuable part of your of your leaf litter is is it's going to put organic material into your soil no matter how terrible it is. Um, and you can restore soil health pretty quickly. We did plant mostly from seed, um, almost entirely from from seed. So uh, I use seeds, the blue jays use seed, the squirrels use seeds, uh, and now when I land landscape when I garden I'm gardening with a chainsaw because so many things came in I'm losing my light in an awful lot of places we heat all winter long with the the wood that has grown on our property in the last 20 years so the one the big message to me is that plants grow and they grow a whole lot faster than you thought they were gonna so um I got a, a completely different kind of question um for you to share examples of colleges, universities, or other schools that maintain their campuses to support pollinators and other vital insects. You know, this is a growing trend around the, the country. Most colleges now have a sustainability committee uh, and they like to boast, boast about it. Um, there are some good examples in the Midwest small colleges <laughs> that I've been to and I can't remember their name. <sighs> there, there are there are universities that have big solar arrays that um, are are using uh, pollinator strips in between those solar arrays and in really productive ways. So it is happening. Um, you want the names to be specific. I'm not going to don't tell anybody. I'm not going to boast about the University of Delaware yet. They've got a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know what, Rowan Rowan uh, University, uh, right over the river in in New Jersey, is doing a real good good job. I was just there, but it is a growing trend around the the country, so um, that's good news. And um, different, uh, probably a safer question: How do uh, hemlocks stack up versus the Keystone Oak? Well, not nearly as good. Um, they do support specialists. Uh, I could give you the exact number. I don't know. Uh, I'll make it up. It's probably around 40 uh, species compared to, you know, over 500. So, but hemlocks, of course, are, are really challenged uh, with the hemlock woolly adelgid. We're losing our hemlocks. It's another invasive uh, insect that we've had very poor luck in, in, in terms of uh, controlling it. 
Uh, we don't want to lose our hemlocks for sure, but they're not going to make the keystone species list. Okay. It's interesting. Uh, some people describe the town where we're talking to you from, Stowe, as a, as a red maple swamp. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, anyway, there it is. Red maple does really well in wet soils. Uh, and, yep. and it is, somebody did a recent study. It is now the most common species uh, of, of deciduous tree in the country. Uh, and that's because of the way we've, we've treated our, our forest. We've logged out, the, you know, the oaks and the, and the, uh, the other more desirable species. We lost the chestnut. Um, we've suppressed fire, which used to keep maples and cherries down and favor uh, oaks. So, um, that's one reason that that uh, maples have increased in abundance, but it's not a bad tree. They are a keystone species. So, good. Um, and we got a comment here: the jumping worm's favorite food is leaf litter, also bark mulch. But the consensus from gardeners with jumping worms is keeping is 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 feed the plants, even though it's also feeding the worms. Um, and keep hand picking the worms using mustard. You know, you pour the mustard on the soil to bring them up and drop them into a jar of vinegar. Human urine apparently also kills them and is a good plant fertilizer. Keep building the soil. Okay, that I, that was a long comment, I guess. Not a question. I thought there was a question in there, but not quite. Well, so, I've heard uh, of mustard. You can make a mustard mixture and that does bring them to the surface and you can pick them up, but that takes a lot of mustard to do your whole yard. I had not heard about the urine. So maybe you can collect that and see how that goes. But <laughs> um, another question. What is happening to beech trees? Well, they've got beech blight. Um, they've got, uh, there's a nematode that is is uh, spreading a beech disease, particularly up north. It's moving south. Um, it, it just hit Delaware this year for the first year. I don't have it at my house yet, but these things get around. Um, it's just another serious challenge to the the trees in our forest that we have imported. Uh, and um, progress is slow. They have figured out that the, there's a nematode involved, but that's about as far as they've gotten. So uh, another serious issue. Yeah. Um. And a different question. I know non-native crab apples have similar leaf chemistry to native crab, crab apples. What about non-native basswood compared to native basswood? Our streets are lined with tons of non-native yeah. basswood. Yeah, that's the little leaf linden. We actually compared that one. Uh, you're right. The uh, Crab apples are, are um, they're genetically very similar. They're so similar that they cross e easily and they share a lot of the chemistry. So insects that eat uh, crab apples and actually malice apples too will cross over uh, quite readily. Um, it's not as good news with the, the, the tilia, the little leaf linden versus our basswood. Uh, far fewer things eat the European little leaf linden. Um, I'd much prefer to see your streets lined with with uh, regular regular basswood. <laughs> um, do you have any tips cataloging caterpillars on our property? Also, tips for photographing them. Uh, obviously, you have beautiful photographs. Um, you know, digital photography makes it pretty easy. You just delete the bad ones, and then you have good ones. But. <laughs> You need, you need a macro lens. Caterpillars are easy because they don't move around very fast. All you have to do is find them and then you can you can take your picture as long as you want. Um, you need a flash. You need to know about macro photography. You need a lot of depth of field, which requires a flash uh, and it requires a, a macro lens. Although, um, you know, the new iPhones, iPhone 14 and, and up 15 with those three lenses, they're really good. <laughs> they're, 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 you know, they're not as good as the best photographic equipment, but they're not bad at all. And in terms of taking pictures of moths and caterpillars, they do a good job. So that's, that's the easiest solution to the photography part of it. Finding the caterpillars is the trick. Um, the, the best way to find caterpillars is to go out at night with a flashlight, because then they're not hiding from the birds and they're out on the leaves. They're much easier to, to find. Uh, if you're looking for sources of, of identifying caterpillars, um, Dave Wagner is is the key. He's, you know, University of Connecticut. He's got caterpillars of Eastern North America. 
Seabrook Lecky has has a, a book on the moths of, of northeastern uh, North America and also the southeastern. So you want to tie in the adult to the to the caterpillar that you find. Uh, but there's a lot more resources out there now. And if you don't know what you have, take a picture of it and put it on iNaturalist and chances are good you will get the answer. Right. So I want to be respectful of your time. We've got one question now. Maybe this is the last question. I'm not sure. This is That's a warning to anybody who has one last question. They want to sneak in. Um, are dogwoods native? Well, actually, this is a two-part question. Are dogwoods native? I have some that just uh, grew by themselves on my property. And is the wild cherry good for caterpillars? Yes, and yes. Um, we have native dogwoods. We've got several species, the Florida dogwood and the gray dogwood and the rough leaf dogwood out, out in the Midwest. Um, alternate leaf dogwood, those are all natives. The Coosa dogwood is not native. We brought that in as an ornamental. That's what brought in the dog, the dogwood anthracnos that has challenged our native dogwoods. Uh, but the dogwoods that bloom early in the spring are, that's Florida dogwood, and they are all native. Coosa dogwood blooms later, usually in June. Um, so the timing of the blooming can can tell you. And also the, the fruit dogwoods, our native dogwoods make berries. Coosa dogwood makes this naughty thing. It's really uh, co-evolved with monkeys in, in Asia. <laughs> so, um, and black cherry. Yeah. Our native, you know, the wild cherries, the black cherry, they're, they're great plants. Great. Well, I want to thank you very much. This has been just a tremendous talk and there are many, I haven't even read the various thank yous that have appeared already in the chat. And, uh, and and several and at least this last comment points out something I would have said. Your books are fabulous. I recommend them to everyone. They've Thank been you. very helpful to me. Thank you, Tina. Do you have some of the some of his books in the library? <laughs> well, I probably do, but now they're <laughs> at Compo in one of five hundred and fifty bins that I'd have to go through. But I can get some for a display now from other libraries. <laughs> That's right. Remember, Christmas is coming, everybody. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. I, well, thanks a lot. Uh, it was fun talking to everybody. Good luck to you all. you all. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.